SpaceX's Starship is fully stacked, Chandrayaan-3 shuts down, and Stokes Space's hop just got even closer. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 8th of September, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. India's Chandrayaan-3 has completed its primary mission, and my oh my, it has done a lot of science in the less than two weeks that it's been active on the surface. We touched on some of this science in last week's episode, like, for example, how the lander's thermal probe found that the temperature of the moon's regolith goes down drastically at a depth of only a few centimeters. Some of the other science includes the discovery of sulfur on the moon using the Pragyan rover's laser-induced breakdown spectroscope, or LIBS. Now, this instrument has also detected other elements such as aluminum, calcium, iron, chromium, titanium, manganese, silicon, and oxygen. Some of these were already expected to be found on the moon, and others were seen previously at other lunar locations. The Chandrayaan-3 lander also included a seismometer that captured the movements of the ground underneath it, and it detected at least a natural source of seismic activity, which is currently under investigation. As you can imagine, it also captured the movement of the rover moving around nearby. But it's not just science that these vehicles conducted on the surface. The Pragyan rover traversed over 100 meters across the surface of the moon until it had to shut down for the lunar night. Now this means that both the lander and the rover had to endure the cold lunar nights with no heating units and no power. So for now, the primary mission is considered complete. But nonetheless, before that happened, the lander also did a small hop on the moon. It ignited its engines and went up by 40 centimeters and moved 30 to 40 centimeters away, becoming the second spacecraft to land on the moon, fly up again, and land some distance away. This demonstrates that the lander's technology could be used in the future for a potential lunar sample return mission. Both the lander and rover are now patiently waiting for the sun to rise again. While there are no guarantees that they'll wake up, ISRO is ready in the event that they do. So what do you think? Will they wake up? ESA and Ariane Space have completed two crucial tests of the Ariane 6 rocket, making it just a few steps away from being fully developed. The first of these tests happened on September 1st at Lampelthausen in Germany, where an Ariane 6 second stage was test-fired for a full duration simulating launch. This test also included active use of the stage's auxiliary power unit, just as it would during flight. The second stage is pretty much now fully tested under expected and nominal conditions, and one test remains for this fall where it'll be tested with degraded conditions. This will ensure that the upper stage demonstrates its reliability even when not in fully nominal conditions. The other test this week happened on September 5th at the Guiana Space Center with the development test article of the Ariane 6 rocket firing its main engines for four seconds. This short hot fire test had originally been scheduled to occur in July and then in late August, but different issues delayed it until just this week. During the test, the vehicle and ground system simulated a full countdown. The rocket was fully loaded as if it were to launch, and its main engine was ignited at the end of the count. The test article will now be prepared for a full duration hot fire test set to occur on October 3rd, and if it occurs successfully, it'll clear the rocket and launch pad systems for launch. While development of Ariane 6 wraps up, the first flight article is in production and it's expected to be shipped to French Guiana sometime early next year. ESA and Ariane Space say that they will not set a launch target date until these two tests are completed, so stick around and we may find out about it in the next few months. Now let's take a look at this week in launches. Starting off the week, we had the launch of a PSLV XL on September 2nd at 6.20 UTC from the second launch pad at the Satish Devan Space Center. The rocket was carrying the Aditya L1 Solar Observatory into a highly elliptical orbit around the Earth. The Aditya L1 is India's first satellite dedicated to studying the Sun's activity and the dynamics within and between its chromosphere and corona. The satellite, now healthy and successfully in orbit around the Earth, will begin a series of orbit-raising maneuvers to set itself on a course toward the Sun-Earth Lagrange Point 1. This point is about 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth in the direction of the Sun. As of recording, the spacecraft is in a 282 by 40,225 kilometer orbit around the Earth, and its next orbit-raising maneuver is set for September 10th. A Falcon 9 lifted off this week on September 2nd at 1225 UTC from Vandenberg in California. The rocket was carrying the last batch of the Space Development Agency's Tranche Zero satellites into a polar orbit. 
The satellites involved in this batch were 10 Tranche Zero transport layer satellites manufactured by Lockheed Martin, another Tranche Zero transport layer satellite manufactured by York Space Systems, and two Tranche Zero tracking layer satellites manufactured by SpaceX. This is the second of two main launches planned for the Tranche Zero constellation. Another four Tranche Zero transport layer satellites by York Space Systems will be launched later this year on a rideshare mission on board another Falcon 9 rocket. The booster for this mission, B-1063, was flying for a 13th time, and it successfully landed back on land at landing zone 4. Another Falcon 9 lifted it off on September 4th at 2.47 UTC from Launch Complex 39A. The rocket was carrying 21 Starlink V-2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit in support of Starlink's second-generation constellation. The booster, B-1073, was flying for a 10th time, making it the 10th booster to reach this mark. That's a lot of boosters now in double-digit flights! As usual, the booster successfully returned to Earth, landing on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. With this launch, SpaceX has now put 5,048 satellites into orbit, of which 4,704 remain in orbit and 3,979 are in operational orbit. A Series 1 by Galactic Energy lifted off on September 5th at 9.34 UTC from the DEFU 15002 barge stationed in the Yellow Sea. It was carrying four Tianchi satellites into low Earth orbit. The launch, dubbed the Little Mermaid, was the first one of this rocket from a marine launch platform and the first maritime launch by a private Chinese rocket. The Tianchi satellites are part of an experimental Internet of Things communications constellation by Guodian Gaoka. This Chongzheng 4C rocket lifted off on September 6th at 1814 UTC from the South Launch Site 2 at the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. The rocket was carrying the third Yaogan-33 remote sensing satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. The satellite adds another one to the Chinese military Yaogan satellite constellation. This week, we also had the launch of an H-2A rocket from the Tanegashima Space Center on September 6th at 2342 UTC. The rocket was carrying the X-ray Imaging and Spectroscopy Mission, or CRISM, and the Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, aka SLIM. CRISM is the latest X-ray observatory from the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, in collaboration with NASA. This next-generation X-ray telescope will bridge the gap between current telescopes, like Chandra or XMM-Newton, and those in the works for the future. It also replaces, in some sense, the Hitomi X-ray Observatory, which was lost in 2016. SLIM is JAXA's first lunar lander that aims to demonstrate a new way of landing more accurately and in a wider range of terrain. The spacecraft will spend a few weeks in Earth orbit, adjusting its orbit before sending itself into a low-energy trajectory around the Earth-Moon system to get captured around the Moon without spending a lot of fuel. Its arrival at the Moon is not expected until next year, and it will spend several months in lunar orbit before attempting to land. Add yet another lunar lander to the list. SpaceX's Crew-6 mission has now returned to Earth, marking the end of the company's original commercial crew contract. Crew Dragon Endeavor, which carried the crew of Crew-6 to the ISS, undocked from the station on September 3rd at 11.05 UTC. After about 10 orbits around the Earth, the crew donned their spacesuits and strapped themselves in for re-entry into the atmosphere. Endeavour executed a 16-minute long deorbit burn at 3.23 UTC on September 4th. The capsule successfully splashed down off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida about 55 minutes later at 4.17 UTC. With this flight, all three rookies on board, Woody Hoberg, Sultan al Nayadi, and Andre Fediyev, have now spent a total of 185 days, 22 hours, and 43 minutes in space. As for the veteran on this mission, Stephen Bowen, he gets to add that to his total time spent in space, which has now grown to 226 days, 8 hours, and 43 minutes. This launch wraps up SpaceX's original commercial crew contract, which is really something considering that Boeing Starliner spacecraft still hasn't carried any astronauts yet. But hey, maybe soon it'll have its time to shine. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. This week, the United States Air Force has conducted a test of an unarmed Minuteman III missile out of Vandenberg. The launch occurred on September 6th at 8.26 UTC, and, according to the Air Force Global Strike Command, this test launch was set to validate and verify the safety, security, effectiveness, and readiness of this weapon system. Meanwhile, on the other coast at Cape Canaveral, there were potential indications of a hypersonic missile test occurring this week. 
This included the release of navigational warnings and temporary flight restrictions that didn't match other sorts of launches from this site. However, it appears this test has been canceled and possibly postponed to a later date. It's always important to remember that from each of these launch centers, there's not only normal rockets launching, but also missile tests. But I'm sure we can all agree that no one wants any of those being used for anything other than tests. SpaceX has rolled out the first section of the Crew Access Tower for Space Launch Complex 40. This tower will eventually support crew launches from this pad, basically providing backup crew launch capability for when Starship launches start happening from Launch Complex 39A. This is just the first of what we expect will be four tower sections. So stick around our Space Coast Live 24-7 livestream and you may catch the next few sections rolling out real soon. Stoke Space's Hopper 2 test vehicle has completed its wet dress rehearsal and is getting ready to perform a static fire test. The tests of this prototype vehicle are in preparation for the long-awaited hop test of the vehicle, which could happen really soon. We're anxiously waiting over here, Stoke. If you love to see Falcon 9 launches as much as we do, get ready for more, because Elon Musk says there's a lot more coming. The company is aiming to achieve a cadence of 10 launches a month by the end of this year in order to reach their goal of 100 launches in 2023, and then aims to perform 12 launches a month in 2024. Now that would total 144 launches for next year. This comes right after SpaceX broke its own record this week for most launches in a single year, completing 62 launches with Falcon rockets compared to 61 last year. We're already buying lots of coffee here at NSF to prepare for the loads of 3 a.m. Starlink launches that'll be coming up with this incredible cadence. Keep it up. Relativity has broken ground at NASA's Stennis Space Center to use the old A2 test stand to test its Terran R rocket. This test stand started off its life supporting testing of the Saturn V S2 rocket stage and was later used to test space shuttle main engines and the J2X development engine. If you notice, all of those are hydrogen-fueled engines, but now this stand is coming back in 21st century style and will be used to test a Methalox rocket, the Terran R. SpaceX has brought another full Starship stack back to Starbase this week with the stacking of Ship 25 on top of Booster 9. This was the first time a booster sporting a hot staging ring has seen a ship placed on top of it, which, by the way, means Starship broke its own record for tallest rocket in the world once again. While Elon now claims the rocket and company are ready for launch pending regulatory approval, teams are still working on the vehicles and the pad systems, and we might still see a few more tests happening before the launch. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. And now let's go over next week in spaceflight. A Falcon 9 carrying the next batch of Starlink V2 mini satellites will lift off from Cape Canaveral next week. Launch is set to occur on September 8th at 2356 UTC, with two backup launch opportunities at 312 and 330 UTC on September 9th. The launch of Atlas V's next mission had to be delayed a couple of weeks ago due to Hurricane Adalia, but it's back on the pad and ready to go. The liftoff is planned to occur on September 9th at 1251 UTC. We'll be live for that, so be sure to set notifications for our channel when that happens. A Changzheng 6A rocket is set to lift off next week with a yet unknown payload. Launch is set for September 10th at 4.40 UTC from the Taiyan Satellite Launch Center in China. A pair of Falcon 9 rockets are preparing for launch next week to carry more batches of Starlink satellites from each coast of the United States. The first one, from Vandenberg, is set to lift off on September 12th within a 3-hour window that opens at 6.47 UTC. The second one, from Cape Canaveral, is set to lift off on September 15th within a 4-hour, 55-minute window that opens at 2.20 UTC. Roscosmos is preparing to launch its next crew mission to the International Space Station, also on September 15th, with liftoff set to occur at 15.44 UTC on that day. The Soyuz MS-24 spacecraft is set to dock with the station just 3 hours and 14 minutes later at 18.58 UTC. And that's your weekly update of Spaceflight News! We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.